Your word is a lamp unto our feet. We thank you for what we've heard today, Lord God. We thank you that we've heard that you, what you say you're going to do, you will do it. And, um, and therefore, we should believe it. And so we ch choose to believe what you say about yourself and what you tell us you're going to do because you are a truthful and faithful God who is totally dependable. So Holy Spirit, fall afresh upon us and may what we hear today cut right into that place where spirit and soul and bone and marrow meet so that the, the truth of who you are will just run through the core of our being and we would be a people who believe what you say and believe that you will do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So our, tech, our title of our message today is Dying in Faith. Let's say that together. Dying in faith. Are you feeling positive? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 to 16. I will read it to you. The reference will come up, but I will read you the f these few verses. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, the author, as I've said before, of the uh, letter to the Hebrews, uh, Jewish Christians, is disputed. <laughs> Some say it was Paul, and, um, and that's fine. Um, I, as you know, would like to believe and hope with all my heart um, that it is Apollos, you see. Because he sounds like he was a dynamic preacher and, and teacher of the gospel. And it would be fantastic, in my opinion, if he wrote the book of Hebrews. But we don't know. The writer is inspired by the Holy Spirit to encourage Jewish Christians to keep their faith. Say that with me. Keep their faith, to keep trusting in Jesus regardless of what is opposing them. That's where the encouragement needs to come in. When things are opposing us, we need to be encouraged to keep focus, to keep trusting, to keep believing, to keep our faith in Jesus. And over the next few weeks, what I want to do is to look at some individuals from the Old Testament who were applauded and I love that, they were applauded by God himself for their faith. So hopefully we'll be inspired by their lives to keep the faith, to keep trusting in Jesus. Is that okay? All right. We remember we're looking at what does faith look like? What does it look like? So often we, 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 ha we desire and seek to take hold of these things that can be so lofty uh, up there. And it's like, but what are we asking for? What does it look like? Because we need to know what we're asking for. We need to know what it looks like if we're going to take hold of it. Do we not? Yeah? It's interesting. Our text starts with these. So who are these people? All right. First one is Abel. Abel. Okay, he tied the first fruits of his faith. In other words, he was bringing an offering to God and he took the, the best of, of what he had. 
and uh, the first fruits, as it were, and he brought it to God. And God accepted what he said and beca- what he gave, and be- this gift that he gave God, and God, and, and God received it. And therefore, God uh, saw him as righteous. Now, Cain was his brother, and Cain brought an offering. Not the first, not the best, but an offering. And, uh, and God did not receive that. And Cain got angry and upset. And God said, why are you getting angry and upset? If you've done well, you'll be applauded. If you've not done well, you won't be. Be careful. Because sin is crouching at the door, seeking to devour you. We need to be very careful when things, in our opinion, are going wrong. We need to be very careful when things are wrong that we are involved in because the enemy is seeking to get in and to make us bitter and he and he may and he encouraged Cain in in a road of bitterness which ended up ended up Cain killing his own brother out of out of jealousy all right Abel brought a fantastic gift to God and it was accepted by him and it was seen as righteous because he bought the best that he could bring all right uh, next person Enoch, Enoch walked with God and, and it was no more. Okay, so Enoch, Enoch um, was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah was the uh, human being who lived the longest on the earth. 969 years, I think, something like that, and uh, longer than Adam. And Enoch was, was his father. That's quite interesting. Now, and Enoch was, um, was, 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 walked with God. He loved God. He, he pleased God. And he so pleased God that it says that um, God looked at Enoch and took him to be with him. So Enoch didn't just die like ordinary people. He, it sounds like he was transported, or some of you say translated, um, into heaven because he pleased God. Why did he please God? Well, we know that the Bible says you, it, by faith we please God. You cannot please God unless you believe that he is and, and that he exists and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. So Enoch trusted God to such an extent that God said, you're going to have to come up here now. We're going to have to hang out closer together. And he was transported or translated in the spirit, uh, you know, to heaven. All right. Abraham. Why was he righteous? <laughs> Why was he righteous? <laughs> he put his faith into action, but he didn't sacrifice his son, did he? He was willing to. He was willing to sacrifice his son, although God, it was a test because God's not interested in human sacrifice. But God wanted to, wanted to know whether Abraham trusted him, even with that which was most special to him. And, and, um, and so, he, so he said, will you Give me your son. And, and Abraham was willing to do that. And God stepped in and said, no, you don't need to do that. I'm not interested in human sacrifice. I'm interested in your heart, that, that you have faith in me, that you have trust in me. And, 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 and because the, Abraham responded, demonstrating faith and trust, he was seen by God to be righteous. And not only righteous, but a friend of God. Yeah, yeah. So God said, "Leave where you are, and and I'll and follow me, and I'm going to take and take you into a land that I'm going to give you." And He just went after God, followed God with all His possessions, and um, and then when He got in the land, God said, "This is the land I'm going to give you." But He was like a foreigner in it for for His whole lifetime. He did not possess it, but was a foreign foreigner in it for His whole lifetime. The possession came centuries later. All right. Um, okay, next one. Sarah. What I find interesting with Sarah is that she laughs when God says she's going to have a baby. And it's a laugh of unbelief. All right. And then when she's, when, when she's, um, when she's uh, admonished, and it seems to be quite gently in my, in my opinion, she then denies that she laughed. You know, yet this Bible still uh, says, the Holy Spirit still says that she was a woman of faith. Oh, isn't that good news? That on your journey of faith, you can be filled with unbelief. You can laugh 
with, with disbelief. You can have a bit of sarcasm and so on as you're going. But as long as you believe at the end of the day, you will be re- seen as a man or woman of faith. Isn't that good news? All right. Thank you. But... See, so scripture says all these demonstrated faith in God and therefore received his commendation. They received his praise. Isn't that fantastic? To receive the praise of God. That's, I, I don't know about you, but that's what I want. Above all, to receive his praise. I want to stand before the throne and hear, Charles, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to s- receive his praise. That's all that matters to me, really, to receive his praise. Because I love him for what he has, because he saved me. And to please him is what my life is about. And so all these guys demonstrate faith. So if I'm going to if I'm going to receive his commendation then what I need to be is a man of faith. You know what I need to do is trust him no matter what. And there is room for me to struggle in that uh, in trusting him. There is room for me to have doubts. There's room for me to have fears. There's room for me to have anxieties. But as long as at the end of the day, I believe what he says and will do what he says, then he will applaud me and praise me when I stand before him. Because above all, he wants me to trust him, to have faith in him. Are you with me? All right. So all these that we've looked at demonstrated faith in God, therefore received his commendation, his praise, but, say but, 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 verse 13 of our text, these all died in faith, not having the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and, have, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They died in faith. What does that mean? Well, they died. They exhaled. That was it. And they exhaled. And they didn't inhale any longer on the earth. They died. But they died in faith in confidence, in trust, in God. They died believing in God. That's so important. There was a a Methodist minister friend of mine a number of years ago had got cancer. And I remember in one of the moves of God that we were experiencing, he came uh, and he was lying on the floor there. Or or, or I think it might have been here. And we hadn't had this little stage built by then. And and I can can see him now as the Holy Spirit's coming on him. He's jerking and, and, you know, and so on. And it's quite amusing. But the power of God was on him. And he got up and he had a tremendous smile on his face. And he really felt encouraged because he'd been in the presence of God and so on and I think he went into remission with his cancer and then a number of years later his cancer came back and I went to see and this time he was getting ready to go to glory and I went to see him at Julius uh, Julius Hospice I, I went to see him there and, um, and knowing he's a Methodist and my background is in Methodism, I said I reminded him of what John Wesley said I said John Wesley said my people, in other words, Methodists, die well. And, uh, and the tears just sprung from his eyes. And he said, Charles, you don't know, realize how important it is that you said that. Because in this place, these, these nurses, the, you know, these carers, they have seen people, clergy, come in. And in the last minutes of their life, lose their faith. He said, I want to go well. I want to go praising God. I want to die in faith. All right. And I believe he did. And so, so they, they had not received the promise. 
God's made them a promise. Abraham was made a promise. Sarah was made a promise. Enoch was made a promise. Abraham was made a promise. And they had not received the promise. So, yet they died in faith. You see, even, I don't know about you, but sometimes after, well, after 30 odd years of being in the ministry, I have seen people lose their faith in God because by a certain time, that which they believed that God had said to them was going to occur had not occurred. And so in the 60s, there was a massive speech, um, a massive conversation about revival and spiritual awakening coming to this land. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was in the charismatic movement, basically. And there was an outpouring of the Spirit, and people were so excited. And people thought, revival's coming, spiritual awakening's coming in our land, like it did in the Wesley's times. And, you know, and we're going to see it in our time, in our generation. And so people were preaching, and so people were teaching, so people were seeking to move in the gifts of the Spirit. So people were giving of their finance, and, and, and big offerings were being taken up. There were big Big praise meetings, and it were, heaven was breaking loose as it were. Angels were seen ascending and descending. It felt like you were on the brink of something. This ha- and it spilled into the seventies, spilled into the eighties, and spilled into the nineties. And then you began to hear of leaders who were at the forefront of things over those decades suddenly not there anymore, to the extent. Some of them had come out of the Pentecostal charismatic movement and gone into the Anglican church or the Methodist church and so on. And it was like they were so tired and so disappointed, but they couldn't leave God, but they didn't want to hear prophecy. They didn't want to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. They didn't want to, um, you know, have God give them dreams, uh, you know, and so on, because 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 it hadn't happened. What they expected hadn't happened, they were discouraged. Some of those leaders even turned their backs on God and walked away from him and now live as non-Christians because that which they thought they had understood that God was saying hadn't happened and they were tired and they were weary and they were disappointed and disillusioned. They hadn't received the promise. And so they gave up. They gave up. They stopped trusting in Jesus. But Abraham, Sarah, Enoch, and and the rest of them, they didn't. They kept believing what God had said, even though they were about to die. And uh, they never gave up trusting what God in, the, in what God had said. Why? Why? Because, well, was it because they were blind? Is it is because they couldn't, um, you know, they, they were living in a, in a fantasy world? Is it because they were un, in denial? You know, so things aren't happening, they're pre- pretending it's, it's, it is happening. Was there a sense of denial on their lives? No, the scripture says this. It says, yet they saw the promises. Faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things. It says they saw the promises in the distance. (laughs) So they saw beyond their life time upon the earth. Okay? And so they saw the promises and, and, and they, said, they said, it's not here now. He hasn't done it now. It isn't, I'm an old man and an old woman and it, and, and it hasn't happened right now here. Abraham said, I'm supposed to possess this land, but I am a stranger. I'm in it now, but I'm a stranger and I'm a foreigner. I'm very small. Notice this, it's very interesting that when he talks about, God said to Abraham, your descendants will be innumerable. They'll be like the stars of, of the heaven, like the grains of the sand, if you c- and you will not be able to count them. That's what he says, doesn't he? 
But what, but what you also have to realize is this, that when he was in the land as a stranger going round and round and round throughout his whole lifetime, he was very small indeed. But can I also say this, when they did actually possess the land, his offspring possessed the land, they were still very small in comparison to the nations around them. And the nation of Israel, although you cannot count them, when you think about it, all those who have Jewish blood in them, they are still the smallest nation on the earth. Think about that. But God so speaks, so God speaks. And, and they see, they see. Abraham sees it. Sees it centuries down the road. He sees that it will happen. And not only does he see it, the fulfillment of the promise, centuries down the road, millennium down the road, they actually greet it. And they say, thank you, Lord. We see it. Because we see it, we, can, we say thank you, and we greet it, and we welcome it. And we may not see it at the, on, uh, in our lifetime on this earth, but we know it's going to happen because we see it. Faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things seen. Come on, correct me. Unseen. Unseen. And God's looking for people who will trust him. Trust him. Whether, it's, whether they've received it in their possession or not. Because you see, they understand that God is eternal. And God works in the, in, in the, in, 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 throughout eternity. And so, will you trust me, God says, to do what I said I've done. Whether it happens in your time or not. And for many saints in the past who have given up, who have walked away from God, the only person they've hurt is themselves. The only thing they've damaged is themselves. That which God showed them, still going to happen. That which God said, still going to happen. God, that which God spoke to them about, still going to happen. But they're not a part of it. You see, those things will happen because God cannot deny himself. Let all be faithless. But he will remain faithful. All right. Yet they saw the promises in distance and greeted them. And I want to say to you that you need to see the promise. What God has said to you. See it and greet it. See it and thank him for it. He'll, what he's spoken to you, he will show it to you. But don't tell him when to deliver it. Don't tell him how to deliver it. Think how silly that is when we do that. We're finite and he's infinite. It still makes sense. He knows best. And for some of you who are men in the house today, we men can be very impatient. We, want, we put our worth in what we achieve. Even if it's somebody who gave it to us, we still behave like we've achieved it. You know? You've got to let that go. Let God is God. And let all men be quiet before him. He will do what he wants to do, how he wants to do it, when he wants to do it. And all we are called to do is trust him and say, yes, Lord, I believe it because you've said it and I welcome it. <laughs> and he said, but when will I see it? You'll see it definitely when you get to glory. <laughs> Most definitely you'll see it then. And you need to be satisfied with that. By gum, it's better than you, you see it there because then you'll see the fullness of it for all eternity. This time is just passing. It's a drop in the ocean of eternity. It's just passing. Yet we behave as it, it's everything. It is not. And so they saw the promises in the distance and greeted them. Steve, you wanted to say something. In the book of Jude, there's a, a prophetic utterance by Enoch who uh, saw from afar, and it's about the second coming. It says, Is Behold. This short? 
make it short. Yep. Steve. It says, "Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints," and yeah. that's that's from Jude's lips, uh, from Enoch's lips. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, he saw things. He saw things to come. But also, you see, they accepted something about themselves. And if we are going to be a people of faith, we need to see ourselves in a particular way. And this is what they saw. They accepted, all right, they accepted, say that with me, accepted. It's so important. They didn't fight it. They accepted that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So important if we're going to be a people of faith, a people who trust God, a people whose confidence is in God. We th it's so important that we accept that we are strangers. If you're a stranger, it means that you don't belong. Okay? You, it means that you're moving, that you are foreign to, to the area, to the land. To, to the family, whatever. You're a stranger. And they accepted that they were exiled. That they, that, 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 that they were moving through. That they didn't belong. So even Abraham, even though this land was promised to him, the one of the reasons why he could believe was because he knew that actually this was, even though when that land was given, it isn't his home. That he's a stranger moving through this earth. An exile moving through the earth. We need to understand that we are in the world, but we're not of it. This is not our home. All the promises that God gives about what he's going to do upon this earth, he is going to do them, but it does not mean that it is our home. We are, remain strangers. An exile. We're going somewhere. And this is just part of the journey. Why do I labor this? Because one of the things that seems to rob us of faith is because we're clinging to this world. We're clinging to the world. We don't want to leave it. You know, even though we should know where we're going. So we're hanging on to live you know, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the last second or minute. We're clinging to the, the spirit of the world. So the spirit of the world says by a particular age you should have a house. By a particular age you should have a wife. By a particular age you should have a husband. By the tip particular age you, ha you should have this amount of pension and all the rest of etc. And we're fighting for these things. And if we're struggling to get them, we feel down, we feel depressed, we feel upset. We feel that God isn't with us, that he doesn't love us, that he doesn't care for us etc. We're constantly comparing. The spirit of the world has us comparing. How are they doing? How am I doing? I should be like them. I should have that by now. They, don't, they have it. Why not me? Etc. You know, and so on. As we know that comparison is the thing that robs us, uh, uh, is a thief of joy. And, and, you know, and we hear that we should be full of joy and, and as God's people. And if we're really honest, many of us aren't full of joy, but miserable. And it is actually because we are clinging to this world. That's why you haven't got the joy that Christ promised you, because you're clinging to it. And what a vain thing to do. What a vain thing for me to do. It's fruitless, because it's not my home. It's not my home. And so they accepted you see, that they were exiles. They were accepted that they were strangers. And that they were, they were passing through. And that enabled them to see what God said he was going to do. To see it occurring. And because they understood that they were passing through, it didn't matter whether it be in their lifetime on the earth or not. What matters is, that it happened. And they took God at his word. Are you hearing me? I'm giving you some good stuff today. That could change so many of your lives. Verse 14. Let's read together. Verse 14. Shall we read together? Is that 
for thus for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland they were at, they were going somewhere it is important to have a home it is important to have somewhere to lay your hat like the song says we need a homeland we must seek a homeland we are not homeless people all right we need somewhere we can call our own god wants us to have someone we call our own after all we are his sons and his daughters james chapter 4 verses 4b to 5 let's read together do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with god therefore whoever wishes to be a friend of god or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy for, for spirit that he has made to dwell in us? It's a good thing it's going up there in it and not, you're not just listening to me. The world isn't our homeland. It is not. And those who cling to it are at war with God. And I think that God some looks at his church and in this country and says, folks, there's some of you praising me, but we're actually at war. We're, you're hostile to me because you're clinging to this world. Don't cling to it. You cannot love this world. And by loving this world, I'm not just talking about creation, the dogs and the cats and the mountains and the hills and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the way of the world, the spirit of the world, how it operates, how it thinks, how it judges things, how it assesses things. And so often in the church, we're loving the world, the way it judges, the way it assesses things, the way it goes about things, and we're bringing that spirit of the world into the church, and we're, and we're clinging to it. And the church is completely different to the world. The kingdom is completely different to the world. And God says, if you love the world, you cannot love me. But the spirit of the world is hostile to me. And so we need to be pursuing the, our homeland. But our homeland is the kingdom of God. Our homeland is where God rules, coming under God's rules, God's ways, God's ways of doing things, God's ways of thinking, etc. And ultimately, getting to heaven, you see. Can I say it's vain again? Why is it vain again, Charles? You know, I'm speaking to myself, you know. Why is it vain again to love this world? Because this world is passing. Now, no matter what we do, no matter how we judge, how we Ch how much do we change to coal, smokeless fuel, dry, use kiln dry wood, you know, move from, um, you know, coal and, and, and gas and, and use wind and, and sea for energy and all that sort of stuff. Insulate our homes, left, right and center. All that is good and we should do it as long, and I'm happy to go along with it as long as they don't take away my open fire because if they do that, then we've got problems. Ahead of time, I have bought smokeless fuel, you know, uh, kiln dry wood. I'm ahead of time. I'm, I'm greener than green, all right, and so on. You know, but with all of that, it's going. It is. It's falling apart. It's decaying. And no matter how fast we're going to patch it up, it's going to go. It's going to go. It's going to go. God said it. And so we believe it. All right. So what's the point of hanging on to it? There is a day coming when God will create a new heavens and a new earth where everything will be in balance, where harmony will reign, justice and righteousness will flow like an ever-flowing st stream, that where the lion will lay down with the lamb, the child will put its hand upon the, the den of a, a snake and it, the snake will not bite him. 
angels and, and cherubims and seraphims, archangels will ascend and descend. We will live forever knowing no more fear, no more crying, no more pain, no more agony, no more sorrow. Everything will be balanced and we'll move from the new heavens to the new earth. At, 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 at the, oh, we'll be translated. One minute we'll be there and one minute we'll be here. What, and so on. Throughout all of eternity, exploring what God has made, exploring who God is, with no devil to tempt us, no flesh to anchor us down, but things just full of beauty and glory and praise, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Cling to that. Cling to that. Cling to what's eternal. Verse 15. Let's read together. For people... Uh, uh, <laughs> let's read together after three. If they had been thinking of that land which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. Jesus said in, um, in uh, Luke 9 verse 63, 62, let's read that. Luke 9, verse 62. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, they weren't, they weren't looking back. They weren't looking back. They were looking forward to that which is to come. That which the Holy Spirit was showing them with, that is to come. They were focused on that. Not looking back. And so often, as if we're not careful, we're looking back. Especially when the opposition arises. Especially when things get difficult. Especially when things do not turn out the way that we want them to turn out. We don't look back. The amount of times I've looked back. I mean, I, I'm, sh I'm, amazing, I'm surprised my neck isn't broken. Just looking back, looking back, looking back. And if you're looking back, you can't go forward. Oh, I wish I'd done it then. Oh, I wish I'd done it like that. Oh, I wish I'd not made that decision. Oh, I wish I hadn't done it. Oh, I wish I hadn't done it. Oh, it's so hard. I, I, you know, if it could, probably would have been easier if I'd done it this way. Oh, I've done it. Oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, there. That's not faith. That's not confidence. That's not trust. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. The righteousness, the peace, and the joy of the kingdom of God if you're constantly looking back. You see, you don't look back when the going's good. You don't look back when the promises have come in the way that you expect them to come, in the time that you expect them to come. Excellent. You don't look back then. But then who would? <laughs> That's not faith. Faith says, I'll not look back even when the going's tough. I'll not look back even when I've failed. I'll not look back even when I don't, I've made mistakes. I'll not look back even if I don't understand. I'll not look back even if people have hurt me and upset me. I will not look back. But I'll keep my eyes fixed on what he said is to come. I'll not look back when I'm sick. I'll not look back as the gray hairs increase on my head. Or the gray hairs increase on my chin. I'll not look back when I'm exhausted. I'll keep my eyes fixed on what is to come. That he has said, because what he says, I'll believe it. Because he is trustworthy. Verse 16. Let's read together. After three. three. But as it is, they desire a better country. Say that. A better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call their God. They desire a better country, a heavenly one. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come. We want to see the new heavens and we want to see the new earth. We want the old to be wrapped up and the one that's eternal to come. Come, Lord Jesus. Are we straining for that? Are we reaching for that? Because if we are, then when God looks at us, he puffs his chest out and says, that's my boy. 
That's my girl. He says, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you because you want to be with me. And in being designed to be with me, you know what is right. And every father wants to know that his children know what is right. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a mansion for you. How about that, eh? I go to prepare a mansion for you. He said, I, I've been with you now. I've, I've, I've died on the cross for your salvation. I'm now ascending to the Father. And I'm not just going to be twiddling my thumbs. I'm on a mission. And I'm preparing a mansion for you. I'm preparing a homeland for you. I'm a preparing a place for you. We are not a displaced people. Even though we are uh, foreigners, uh, strangers, exiles upon our time on this earth, we are going somewhere. There's a homeland, there's a mansion, there's a field, there's a, a place prepared for us. Jesus has prepared it. Yes, there is a city whose foundation has a foundation. It's important, it has a foundation. You need a foundation. Foundation speaks of that which lasts, speaks of that which is, which is meant to remain, speaks of that which is permanent. How, much, how many of you want to be involved in something that lasts, that remains, that is permanent, that is solid, that is steadfast? Yes, there's a city who's has, who's founda has a foundation and the, the designer and the builder is Jesus. And he's done it for us. He's done it for you. And he's done it for me. Oh, uh, I love Simon. He's an architect and I love him. I, I love Nigel Turner, architect, and I love him. But I'll tell you something else. I love Jesus, the great architect. <laughs> he really has got it all together. And he's done it, doing it for me. And he's doing it for you. So what does a man and a woman of faith look like? When you look at them, there's something not quite right. <laughs> they don't fit in this world. They're different. They go against the grain. They think against the grain. Their attitudes are against the grain. Different. And people, people, some people like them and some people don't. Some people can't be, but be nasty to them. And other people just can't have to hang around with them. And, and, and they're, always, they're always looking for something else to come. And yet they've got this contentedness about them that they're living every day for what it is. Abraham lived every day for what he was in, that, in the land which he was supposed to have and own, which, but he didn't. He was a stranger in it. He, he just got on with what he had to do every day. He was content. Oh, hear me! He was content. They look like strangers because they're not holding on to anything that everyone else is, the majority of people are holding on to. They're, they're, they've got momentum and they're going forward. And they, in their eyes, have just got this look of destiny. Of destiny. When you look at them, you see they're seeing things and hearing things which doesn't make them of no earthly use now. Actually, they're very useful and content. But you know they're going somewhere. They're going somewhere. And if you're not a Christian, you don't. You don't. You, you think well, I don't know where they think they're going, but they they definitely b believe they're going somewhere. This is what faith 
looks like. This is what it is to believe in God, to rely on him, to trust him. And God praises us. Isn't that wonderful? And says, yes, you, you trust me. And that's all that matters. Amen. Let's stand together. And so, Lord, we come before you as a people that love you and delight in you. You are everything to us. And we're determined to die in faith. <laughs> because you are the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in you shall live. And even though he dies, yet he shall live. Your promises are yes and amen. And we're content to see them here. But if not, we're content to see them on the other side. We thank you that what you say you're going to do, you do. And we believe in you. Because you are a faithful God. And so God, we want to please you. We want you to be as proud as punch. Our over us and so God help us to keep our focus on you and your promises and what is to come in Jesus name and everybody said Amen